Hello, in this video I'm going to be giving you a detailed explanation on how I'm finishing this guitar. We're going to be covering uh, grain fills, dyes, sanding sealers, spraying clear coat, spraying a burst, what products I'm using, why I like them, how I'm mixing up paint, a bit of spray gun technique. Uh, there's a lot of information to cover so it's going to be quite a long video so I shall chapterize it along the bottom. Uh, you can skip to the bits that you're interested in. As always if you've got any questions then just stick them in the comments, I'm very happy to answer questions. And if you like this video, then please press the like button. It's the best way to support the channel. So I'll run you through the specs quickly because that will impact the finish we're doing. We've got a quilted maple top, which is going to be dyed purple, not a million miles away from what you've seen me do before. There's a one piece mahogany back. And then the neck is roasted maple. And we've got ebony headstock veneer, Pale Moon Ebony fretboard and some Mickey Mouse inlays. Now with this being roasted maple, we don't need to grain fill this. I will lacquer this, but it's not going to get grain, grain filled. So I'm going to grain fill this separately. Um, and I'm not going to do a tinted grain filler, which you've probably seen me do at least once or twice before. I'm going to use epoxy to finish this. And I want to keep this um, a natural a natural looking color. I don't want any any darkening really. So the reason I'm not going to be using a coloured grain filler is because, and I found this actually with a previous guitar I finished, there's a little bit of discoloration in the mahogany that just appears. Let's see if I can... So just here, there's just a slightly darker patch in the grain and that looks fine when we keep it completely natural. But if I go and add a dyed grain filler in there, that will go almost black and it will look pretty unsightly. Um, and on, on a previous build where I had this, I had to um, come back and spray a brown shader over this to even it all out. So I want to try and avoid that because I want to keep it as natural as possible. Look at that faux binding, that's going to look gorgeous. In fact, this top's going to look gorgeous. Let's put a bit of white spirit on so you can see what it looks like. Yeah, this is going to look absolutely fab, I think, in purple. So the first thing I'm going to do is tape off the top and the neck pocket and then I'm going to spray a coat of sanding sealer on the back and the sides. And what that's going to do is seal off the grain and just prevent the um, z epoxy, which I'm going to use to grain fill this, from soaking down too far and it should limit the amount of applications that I need to add. Um, and the other thing about sealing it first is that it will highlight any scratches that I may have missed, which is quite possible. So I've just got this upside down on a box. I'm going to wipe it down with a tack cloth to get as much of the dust as I can out of the grain and then I'm going to spray it with this stuff which is just some rattle can cellulose sealer. Cellulose being compatible with the cellulose top coats I'm going to spray. Uh, cellulose it's nitro to our American friends. Um, you can get this in a pint pot that you can mix with cellulose thinners if you're spraying multiple guitars but for one I'm only going to spray one coat of this um, this is cheap enough it's just easier to do this and bother about cleaning up the gun afterwards um, I need to put my mask on So this is Zap Z Epoxy I'm using here, um, PT41. I think, to be honest, for grain filler, you could probably get away with using any finishing resin, providing you sand it down to bare wood afterwards. 
Um, I don't envisage an awful lot of issues with compatibility with this stuff, to be honest, because cellulose tends to stick to most things. It's most things that don't stick to cellulose that's usually the issue. So I'm just measuring out 50-50 of each. I think I probably only need about four grams of each. There we go. And we just need to mix this up. It doesn't smell very nice, this stuff. Strong smell of ammonia. Now I've just got a uh, shower squeegee. And I'm going to use that to apply it all. So I'm taking the excess off and just putting it somewhere else. That's how it goes so far. It's very easy to over sand these edges and then basically sand straight through your grain filler. So if you really work it in there, it can uh, mitigate that. So we want these edges to be just as smooth as the back. I'm just trying to work it into these uh, edges here. It's quite difficult to get the squeegee into the toggle cavity, so if I just work it in with my finger. And I don't want loads of excess in here either, because it'd be a nightmare to get out again. There we go. So I'm not too fussed if I get it on the maple as well. This is all going to be sanded back down to bare wood anyway. Now I want to be careful that I don't get it all over the inside of this neck pocket if I can help it. So I'm just putting it on sparingly. And I think this is working quite nicely. Right, so I shall leave that to dry and tomorrow morning I shall give it a sand. That's lovely, that's really made that mahogany pop. Oh, I need to... Uh, wash these out with some white spirit. So it's the following day, this has had oh, nearly 24 hours to cure, so I'm going to give this a sand. I've got 320 grit paper on here, which I'm just going to use the orbital to do the back, and then it'll be hand sanding for the sides, and then we shall reapply. <laughs> Can you see all these white spots here? That is all the epoxy dust in the pores. So when I'm done sanding, I need to get all that dust out and then I need at least one more application, maybe even two. So this has had two coats of z epoxy now. Um, then I sanded it down to bare wood. And then the last thing I did was to spray one last coat of sanding sealer on it. And the whole idea of that is it would just highlight any patches if I missed them. Um, Basically any patches where I hadn't sanded down fully to bare wood, where, where there was still some z epoxy, that would just appear a slightly different shade. I haven't missed any patches, so that's good. There is a darker patch here, but actually that's just a bit of movement in the mahogany. I don't know if you can see that on camera. 
So to dye this top then, I've got some purple angelus leather dye, diluted between 20-25% in some acetone. I've got some cotton rags to apply the dye with, and I've got some acetone to knock it back a bit with. Nitrile acetone proof rubber gloves. Spare gloves because the dye gets everywhere. To get to this point I sanded it to 240 grit, I went over it with a damp rag to raise the grain, sanded it with 240 again, repeated the damp rag and then I sanded it with 320 so now we've got a nice smooth surface to work with. You see I've got this in a pot, that's not only because I've diluted it but also because the dye goes on to the rag much better if you've got something to actually dunk it in rather than just tipping it onto the end of a bottle. This is going on nice and smoothly. We want to get plenty on there, but we don't want too much excess on there. There's a tendency to want to start in the same place when you come back with a freshly charged rag. If you do that, you tend to find you get loads of dye in the same place, and that place gets way darker than the rest of it. So it's good to start somewhere else when you come back with a fresh rag. Observant among you may notice this top has been dyed once before. That's because this is actually a post apocalyptic refinish we're doing here rather than a fresh stain job. Maybe I'll share the details of that at the end of the video. So I'm just using another rag here just to try and take off any excess that's still on there that we don't want. Oh, I've missed a bit there. So the acetone, there's two reasons for that. One, that's going to pull out any of that excess colour because it works as a thinner. So we're pulling colour out, the excess colour, but we're also moving colour around and that just makes the wood take the colour a bit more evenly. Purple is such a strong pigment that if you don't pull out some of that excess colour then you tend to find that it just goes really dark and you can't see any of the figure. So now that the purple dye is dried I'm just going to knock this back a bit with um, this is a Merca Merlon 360 pad. It's not a brand new pad, a brand new one they're a little bit too coarse and they can scratch it but this will just help me knock back the finish a little bit. This will help me knock back the colour just a little bit and it'll make the, pot, the figure pop a bit more and it will just reduce the intensity of the purple a little bit. And uh, I'm not doing a full-on sand back. 
The trouble with purple is it's pretty bad for fading. And if you do a you know, really heavy sandback with purple, then you tend to find it fades to nothing in no time at all. And, uh, so I'm going over it with a tack rag and I'm just making sure all that purple dust is pulled out of the grain. Otherwise we'll end up with loads of dark spots in it, which we don't really want. You can see it's pulling out quite a lot of the uh, purple there. The other thing is I'm trying to sand with the grain as much as possible. Although this is quite a fine pad, if I start going in this direction then we are bound to see some very fine scratches which we don't want. I'm also not pressing very hard. If I press too hard then we probably will end up scratching it. So this is quite a time consuming process so I won't show you the whole thing. I've saved sanding these pot recesses until last. It's important we don't sand these too heavily. We don't want a ring around the edge, which is quite easy to do, particularly if you just use something like 320 or 400 grit sandpaper. These pads are a lot better for this. So we can just very carefully, in the middle of it here, and take out a little bit of the color. We want those ribbons in the quilt to go down and through and everything be consistent. And obviously this is end grain and this is end grain here, so these bits are darker, so we just want to carefully target those bits without taking too much colour out the edge. This is all time consuming and boring stuff but without these steps then um, you won't really see much figure. This will go quite dark if I just sprayed it like this. And actually if I left this colour like this, using the lacquer I use, this purple will go much more blue, it will be more of a kind of bluey indigo purple. So I'm going to come back in a minute with some light rose angelus dye and that's going to again lift some of these purples but it's also just going to make sure that it stays kind of on the pinky side of purple rather than the bluey side of purple which is what Jeff, who this is for, wants. So now that I've pulled out some of that dye, um, obviously this is a little bit coarse, so I'm just going to come back with the extra fine now. This, this is supposedly the equivalent of 1500 grit, but I do think it's more coarse than that. It's probably more like 800 or something like that. But it will just pull out a tiny bit more colour. And if I've left any marks on it, then uh, this should remove those. Yeah, see, we can just start to see these ribbons appear a bit more. Those are the area where the quilted maple is hardest, so not as much dye has gone into those, so the act of sanding back pulls the dye out of those hard areas and uh, gives us that contrast, which we want. Cool, so now that I've knocked that colour back a bit, I'm going to use some light rose angelus dye, and that's just going to introduce some pink into it, and that's going to just ensure that the purple stays on the pinkier side of purple, and not the bluier side of purple. And it's going to pull out some of those uh, purples anyway, See that there? So I shall turn this over a bit, keep going. If I don't change this quite frequently, we will end up just moving purple around as opposed to introducing the pink colour, which we do want. Let's get a fresh one.
And it probably doesn't look much different on camera at the moment. But the, the pinks will start to show up a bit more, I think, once, once we've got a few coats of lacquer on there. I think I'll leave that overnight and then we will cut the natural binding, roll those edges over, and then it'll really start to pop. So now that this is fully dried, I'm going to roll this binding over. And I've got some 120 grit sandpaper here, so fairly coarse. Um, but the whole point of that is that the dust it makes is going to be quite large and the dust isn't going to get into the pores. And I'm just rolling this edge over here, putting a, a noticeable facet into this edge. And I'll blow the dust off. And then in a minute I'll wipe it down with a tack rag as well. This is always the bit that really makes it go pop for me. And we have to be careful doing this. Um, you see all that dust there, so you want to keep moving the sandpaper around so we're using clean sandpaper. And extra careful not to scratch the top, because if we, if we uh, touch this top with 120 grit sandpaper, we're going to have 120 grit scratches in it, which we definitely don't want. So once I've been round and put this facet in all along that edge, I'll then come back with 240 grit paper and then 320 and then just smooth it all over and that will really make that edge nice and soft with a nice crisp line. So I've got the colour on, I'm happy with the colour, I'm happy with the binding. It's now time to seal the colour. I'm using Chestnut Cellulose Sanding Sealer, which is the same stuff I use to seal the back and the sides. And the whole point of this is not to build up a protective layer of finish, it's just to stop that colour running when I come to spray my clear coat over the top. And what's going to happen is it's going to penetrate into the wood and that's going to cause some slight colour changes. It will react with the colour as well slightly. We'll probably see the darker patches, they'll get a bit darker. The lighter patches, they'll get a little bit lighter. It will all pop a bit more. And we might start to see some of those pinks showing through. Uh, once we've got a few coats of this on, that might come with, um, with lacquer. And the, the thing to be concerned about with this is that as this is going to cause the dye to penetrate the wood a bit more, this may cause a little bit of bleed around here and um, all the end grain areas. So the key thing with this is to do very light mist coats. After one coat, I will come back and inspect these areas. If it's caused the colour to bleed at all, then I can come back with a bit of 240 and 320 and sand that bleed out. And then I will basically check with each, each coat if there's any bleed and address it. And as I add each subsequent coat, then the bleed will reduce if there is any bleed at all. So it's really important just to do very light mist coats. Don't overdo the sealer. This is coat number one. That's it, that's all we need. Even if you think you missed a bit, don't spray any more, let it dry inspect those edges and then we'll do another coat afterwards. So I've got a tiny little bit of bleed around here so I'm just lightly sanding that out. It's a fresh tack rag. I want to make sure I get any dust out of it now. There's still purple coming out of it. This is coat number two. That can's empty. This is coat number three now. Fresh can of sealer. Still doing mist coats. I 
do for number three. It's the fourth coat just about to go on. Still a little bit of purple coming out of it. Just how much dust there is that gets everywhere. I think that will probably do. So this stuff dries in seconds. Really you can reapply within two or three minutes. I tend to leave between five and ten minutes between coats. Here you go, you can really start to see those colours shine through now. So we've got four coats of sanding sealer on this now. That's plenty to stop the dye from running. Remember we're not building up a layer of finish, we're just making sure that that dye is impregnated into the wood and isn't going to run when we put the clear coats over the top. Now I know I'm going to get several comments saying, oh it's too dark, you should have sanded the purple right back and gone over it with some rose dye or something. Yes that might make the figure pop a bit more, but in no time at all those purples will fade, or the blues in the purples will fade particularly, and we'll be left with a pink guitar, which we don't want, we want a purple guitar. So this is a nice halfway house between popping the figure and keeping that colour we're after. Now the other thing, about cellulose which we're using here. This cellulose has reacted with the colour and that's going to mean that the clear coats I spray over the top are going to melt into that sanding sealer, meaning there's going to be colour in those first few coats of clear coat. So whatever we do, we do not want to sand those first few coats of clear because we will affect the colour. And if we were to sand through some of the colour in the clear, you'll, you'll see a patchy area in the finish, which we don't want. Now, you know, we could use something like a polyester base coat or something instead of a sanding sealer like this. Um, that will produce, a, you know, like a layer of plastic over the top of it, which will protect the colour and completely separate it from the top coats. Um, but then you've, you know, you've got a layer of plastic over the top of it and it doesn't tend to age quite as nicely, I think, as cellulose. If you get chips and things like that in, um, in any sort of polyesters or polyurethanes, then they just tend to go white and don't look very nice. And they're hard to repair, whereas cellulose, um, it will all age much more consistently. Um, you know, eventually we'll get shrinkage and crackings and uh, cracking and things like that, um, and it will just it will just look a bit nicer, I think. And cellulose has a much more glassy feel than, than polyurethanes and other finishes, so that's why I like it and that's why I'm doing it the way I am. Now, I'm getting ready to glue the neck in. This doesn't fit. This is too tight, contrary to popular belief. Um, a neck pocket this tight, the, the force of pushing it down is gonna be so great that we could very well crack the underside um, and also it's going to push all the glue out so that's not going to give us a good joint. So what I do, let's get this neck out and see how difficult it is to get it on. I've got, uh, this is a straight block of marble here, anything straight will do. And this is some 120 grit sandpaper that's fairly well used. And what I do is take even passes on both sides, like this. And then we will give it another fit. So I can already feel that goes in more easily, but that's still a bit too tight. So we're gonna come back once more. And notice how I'm sanding all the way down the length of it. That's because we don't want to push the taper in like that, because it will be noticeable if we have to take away a lot of material. Let's take one more on this side. Let's try it again. So 
still a bit too tight. We're getting close now though. Still too tight. And the other thing I want to check is that I'm not introducing any gaps down either side. So far we're still nice and square. Still a bit too tight. going in nice and easy now. We want it so that the guitar just starts to lift away from the neck as we pick it up. And I'm taking even strokes on both sides because I want to make sure I don't screw up the alignment that way. You can see I've got these holes already drilled here and normally when I finish guitars I will glue the neck in and then I will drill these holes. So normally when you see me finish a guitar, I will have actually glued the neck in before I do any of the die. Um, because I'm refinishing this and I took the neck off, these holes are already drilled so I need to be extra careful that that alignment's correct. And the alignment is more of an issue when you've got a single cut like this because you've got so much more gluing and clamping sur surface on this side and that's more likely to want to push the neck over this way. So it's worth checking the alignment when we actually go to clamp it and it might be that we need to put another clamp here to clamp the neck in that direction. But we'll see when the time comes. That's nice now, that feels good. There we go just starting to lift away as I pick it up. That's what we want. So that's ready for gluing now. So apparatus for gluing the neck, we've got some tight bond original, an F clamp, a paintbrush to spread the glue around, some hot water from the kettle about five ten minutes ago so it's still hot hot and a scalpel. And the scalpel I'm using just to scratch up the underside here and that just gives the glue somewhere else to go other than out and I find it just makes for a better glue joint. Um, and I've got a clamping call, the same shape as the back of the guitar on the underside. And we really don't need a huge amount of glue here. It will all squeeze out anyway. And now that I've put that glue in, this joint is going to be way tighter than it was a few minutes ago. See, even now, after making the fit that much looser, the neck won't go all the way down just from hand pressure. So now we need the clamp. 
and I tend to clamp around here, that's in the middle of the joint, thereabouts. Now I remember on my last video I had somebody commenting on my clamping technique, telling me I was going to damage the frets. These are stainless steel frets and there's a plastic call on the end of the clamp. You tell me which you think is going to come off worse. Make sure that's down properly. I can see good squeeze out all around the bottom, so that's good. Paper towel. Just gonna flip this over. And I'm gonna wipe off a load of the excess glue. Now the hot water and the toothbrush has to make sure we do a proper job of cleaning out all this glue. If you don't do that, then the glue gets into the grain and you end up with a horrible white line around the outside of the uh, glue joint. Um, and unless you're doing like a painted finish, solid color painted finish, it's pretty much impossible to hide that, i found. No amount of sanding will ever get rid of it. So, the hot water trick works really well. This does mean that we're going to leave it a good 24 hours at least before we uh, do any clear coating because water and cellulose are not friends. Just going to make sure that's down properly and give it another little tighten with a clamp. I think we might be okay. So I'm going to leave this clamped for a few hours and then I shall unclamp it, make sure everything's okay with the joint, which I'm sure it is, and then we'll lacquer it probably tomorrow or the day after. So I'm just going to show you my spraying setup. Down here I've got a 26 litre Sealy compressor tiny thing that is and then up here is my airline filter for filtering out moisture um, that really doesn't have to do much at all actually because I empty this at the end of every spray session because it's such a tiny compressor if I spray three coats in a day I'll empty at the end of that day any moisture that's in the tank then drips out so there's barely any moisture that gets through the lines you want to avoid moisture getting into your lines because you will end up with fish eye in the finish and then this is my spray gun, which is an Inest Iwata LPH80, which is a low volume, low pressure LVLP gun. Barely needs any air at all, which is why I can get away with using such a small compressor. There's my airline coming in, down here, connect the gun up. You could probably hear that flapping sound. That's the grill on the back of the wall for my extractor, blowing around in the wind. It's really windy today. So that's an ATEX rated axial fan that's mounted to the wall. ATEX rated means it's explosion proof or a brushless motor. Um, that's mounted to the wall. Um, this is an exhaust chamber I've got here, which I've, it's just, you know, it's just a DIY plywood box effectively. There's some chicken wire over the top of it. Then I've got my paint filter. That's a fresh paint filter on there. That's why it's so green. Um, and I just screw that down and the chicken wire stops it getting sucked through. Um, the fan is rated for, I think it's 30, 32 meters. Uh, cubic meters that is of airflow. Um, this spray booth is, ooh, I think it's about five cubic meters. Um, so the fan is in theory overkill for the space. Um, but then if my filter gets a bit clogged up, then you know it's not quite as efficient. So it works very well for what I've got here. So I'm about ready to spray some clear coats now. Um, I've just got some, this is high build pre-catalyzed cellulose lacquer that I've got mixed up in a bit of thinners. Um, I'll probably thin this down a bit more yet. You've probably heard the term flash coat banded around before. That's, that's effectively just a 50-50 mix of thinners and lacquer. Um, I shall probably thin this to close to that and that's just because I want those first couple of coats to really penetrate any open pores that might still be in the wood. You can generally get a feel for how thin the paint is by how quickly it comes off the filter. I'm 
Yeah, I'll just add a couple of drops of thinners in there. In my workshop at the moment, it's 20 degrees C and 35% humidity, which is very dry. And that's because it's very cold at the moment, so I've got a heater on pretty much all the time. And the heater is drying the air out, so I'm just adding a bit of, this is, um, uh, I think it's called anti-blush thinners or anti-bloom thinners. Effectively, it's just some cellulose thinners with a bit of retarder in, um, and that's just going to slow down the drying ever so slightly. We should just reduce orange peel. Just put a drop of that in. It's probably going to be thin enough now. Notice how I filtered the thinners. These, um, if you don't clean these out then the last bit of the lacquer tends to dry at the bottom and then they're essentially one you throw away um, and it gets quite expensive if you use a fresh filter every time you have to uh, pour some paint out. Let's give that a stir. There you go, you see that's a bit thinner now. It's like almost as thin as water, not quite. So when I'm spraying a set net guitar one of the hardest things is to how do you hold the thing while you're spraying it because obviously we're spraying the entire guitar so we can't we can't touch anything we've just sprayed so what I tend to do is I'll spray the headstock first and then I'll spray the sides and then I'll spray the back and then I'll spray the front and then you can usually hold it here spin it round, you can hold it here as well and I can just come round and uh, ch -ch -ch, like this giving it a good wipe down with the tack rag first make sure there aren't any specks of dust and then I will blow the dust off it as well just in case I missed any bits see me spraying and nothing's happening it's because if you pull the trigger in slightly it lets air out but it doesn't actually spray any paint so you can use the spray gun to blow any dust off it particularly the cavities So I'm going to spray a bit of a burst today and I've just got some, this is mostly thinners, a tiny bit of lacquer and a lot of dye as well. This is chestnut black alcohol based dye. In my experience you can use pretty much any alcohol based dye in cellulose and it will be fine. I've used this, um, I've used Angelus dye, what else? Um, some crimson spirit based dye, I've put that in lacquer before and it all works fine. The only thing you should be aware of is when you add 
black dye to your lacquer, it has a tendency to look a bit blue, so the thing to do is add a bit of brown to it and that makes it look less blue and more black. So it's almost as if we're spraying a really dark brown as opposed to a black, but that's the way to do it. It doesn't really matter if it looked a bit blue with this because it's a purple guitar anyway, but I have added a few drops there. And I'm just going to filter this into my little colour pot here. So even with a liquid colour like this, it's still really important to strain the colour. See, I can see some little bits in there. Um, and that will just be some, you know, like some solid residue that's probably in the bottom of this dye bottle. Um, and we definitely don't want that going on because then we'll see little splutters of colour on the top of the guitar, which we definitely don't want. Now with this already being a dark purple guitar, I'm not spraying a sort of a big teardrop burst like you'd expect to see on a Les Paul. We're just doing a really subtle edge burst. So I've got this really, really thin and I want as much colour as I can get from as little material as possible. That's why it's really thin. And I'm going to be setting my gun up with a really fine um, fan on it. So I'm just painting the very, very edge. So when I was spraying the clear coats, um, I've got the gun on this gauge here set to just over 10 psi and I've got my fan pretty much all the way open or close to all the way open and I've got quite a lot of paint coming out so I've got quite a lot of paint coming out at a fairly low pressure with a wide fan. To do this burst I pretty much want to do the opposite so to set the gun first off I'm closing the paint all the way up and I'm closing the tip all the way up so we've got pretty much nothing. If I let a tiny bit of paint out there you go. There's still too much paint there. Now, by closing this up, this is adjusted, this, temp this pressure here, so now this is saying about 30 psi. That's a bit too high, so now I need to turn that down a bit. So I just turn that down to my gauge to about 15. Now I've got slightly less paint coming out. I think that still might be a bit too much. There we go. So I'm setting it so I've got barely any paint coming out at all. And I find that makes it much easier to control the burst. It takes a lot longer, but I can just... And then if I want it to go a bit darker, I can just go over it. Like this. And spraying in this pattern like this, it means that my pattern is pretty much a circle. If I increase this and have a bigger fan then it's going to be a long line instead. If I just open it up now you'll see. Some more paint on it. Like that. Well the trouble with that is when I'm going around the guitar our burst will look like that which we definitely don't want. So I'm just setting it so that it's back to how it was. So we've got a dot, that's it. And the other reason why I want a very small fan, even though this is just a dot here, there's actually quite a lot of overspray around it. And if I have a bigger fan, that's going to end up darkening up most of the guitar. Because we've already got quite a dark guitar anyway, we don't want to make it any darker because we won't see any of that nice quilt figure. So we're just going to do a really fine burst right around the outside. I'm just going to go over it, probably a little bit more paint than that. Yeah, that'll do. So, let's crack on. Now the last thing I just wanted to mention quickly about the overspray. I'm going to be spraying outwards. So, when I'm spraying this part, I'll be spraying up. And this way, I'll be spraying that way. And that's just going to help to reduce the amount of paint that goes on the rest of the guitar. And you can see I've taped off around the neck here 
but I haven't bothered taping off the sides because this is so thin it'll be so easy to sand out if I get any on the sides and it'll just I'll just clear up this um, binding edge with a little bit of sandpaper afterwards. So that's the burst done, probably only took three, four minutes. You can see there's this kind of mat all around the edge here. Um, and that's essentially because the paint went on so dry and it kind of looks a little bit like really fine orange peel. Um, and that is the really fine particles of paint that make up this transition. So once we get a few coats of clear on this now, it'll all level off and it will be a nice smooth transition that you just can't get with a hand rubbed burst. Um, had we have done it with, with wet coats, we'd end up with a clown burst around the edge or it would just be a really heavy burst, which we don't want. This is a bit of 320 here. I'm just very carefully removing a bit of that overspray off the binding. Very lightly. blow the dust out of it. So for spraying some clear coat then, we want to build up a layer of paint now. So this is mixed a bit thicker, this is more like 70-30, that's generally how I would spray some clear coat. I've uh, reduced the pressure back down on the gun to about about 12 or 13 psi as registered on here this isn't necessarily 12 or 13 psi it's just 
I know that this gun sprays well when this says 12 or 13 psi. So if you're using a different gun, it might that might be a different number. Um, and when I, I remember when I first started spraying clear coat, I had the mindset that of I just want to get as much coverage as I can. You want to get as much paint on as you can, but you want to get it as level as you can. So I used to think, right, we just need to open this up all the way. This is the um, knob that controls the size of the fan. They used to think that you just want the fan as open as you can possibly get it to get as much paint on. So if we spray a line, so we've got quite a big fan here. That's probably at least five inches wide, but it's very fine. It's a very soft edge. So we've got an amount of paint that's spread over quite a great distance. Um, and the trouble is, this is quite dry, this stuff here. And when we overlap, we'll get sort of dry patches. So we'll spray another one next to it. We've got two kind of dry patches here, and that's how we end up with orange peel. Um, if you just hold the trigger down, and then gradually bring this in until it starts to affect the pressure, because the size of the fan essentially we're reducing the hole here that the air and the paint can come out increasing the pressure so if we just adjust this so that the pressure just starts to be affected so if I, I can do this with the other hand I'll turn this in a little bit and then I just start to turn this just until we see an increase of pressure there we go and back down and now if I spray a line so we've got a smaller fan than we had before, but this edge here isn't as soft. And now if I do my 50% overlap, I'm getting good paint coverage over the whole area. So I may have to do one more pass, um, but I'm getting more paint on in a concentrated area, so it's going to be more level when it starts to dry. And you might find, you know, straight after you've painted it, it looks a little bit ripply. Um, that will level off over you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or however long it takes the paint to dry. And that will just go on a little bit smoother. And adding the, uh, the retarder thinners that I talked about before, that just slows the paint down, it just slows the drying of the paint down a bit, and that will enable it to level off a bit more. So the first coat might look a bit rough, the second coat might look a bit rough, but if you stick to that technique, each coat should get subsequently smoother than the last one um, just as we're building more and more level coats and when you are spraying like this there's quite a lot of paint coming out here so you do have to move quite quickly like that to get decent coverage if you stop see we've got way more paint on there now that's when we're more likely to get runs we don't really want runs well we don't want runs at all but we certainly don't want them in the first couple of coats because if you sand those first couple of coats, um, you know, there's a chance we're going to go through the colour. If that does happen, the thing to do is just to keep spraying. Let that dry, and then spray another coat, and then another coat, and then start to do a little bit of level sanding. Then do a bit more spraying, then do a little bit more level sanding. The beauty of cellulose is that it melts into itself. It's one homogeneous layer, so you don't have to worry about witness lines. And finally, we want to keep track of our coats. So I just keep a little tally. So, Jeff. And then I do a little line there. The big line will denote the days. The little line will denote the coats. And then if I come back and I do some level sanding, 
I'll put an S and then another line for another code, etc. And then when I get to the end, I'll write the date. That way I know when was the last date I sprayed it, how long I need to leave the lacquer to cure. So it is the following day from when I sprayed the burst and an initial coat of clear. And I've sprayed two coats today and I'm going to spray one more. Um, when I'm building up the clear coats, I tend to leave them about 45 minutes apart and I don't sp spray any more than three coats in a day. Um, I'll bring you in a bit closer because you probably won't be able to see right now, but um, we've got these little uh, kind of like divots in the finish at the moment. Um, there were more prior to these two coats, but now we can only see them in the really dark spots. That, that is the soft grain. Um, remember we're spraying wood and some of these bits are softer and some of these bits are harder. So the, dark, the paint is soaking down into the soft bits and sitting on the surface in the harder bits. So as we keep spraying, um, that lack is just building up and building up and it's leveling itself off. And I think if I do one or two more coats, then it'll be fairly level and it'll be at a point where I might think about doing some level sanding. So spraying wood, I, I always get this, this comment every now and again from various users who make out that I don't know what I'm doing because I spray up and down instead of side to side. Well, we're spraying wood and wood has a grain direction. You know, it's not like a, a, a panel on a car, a bumper or something where you've got a perfectly level surface to start with. If you spray a shader on the back and you spray left to right, you're more likely to see lighter and darker spots from the overlap. Whereas if you spray up and down, that kind of overlap is hidden from all the grain. You know, the, we've got a, like a lighter patch here and you know, they kind of move around and stuff. So yeah, that's why I spray up and down because that's the direction of the grain. It just makes sense to me. You sand up and down, you spray up and down. That's just how we do it. And uh, if you've been watching my videos before, you'll probably notice that I've retired the bit of a uh, garden twill that was up here and I replaced it with a, um, that's an old coat hanger. But I noticed that it doesn't spin very easily. So I've just replaced the hook at the top with a swivel hook so I can spin it around. It's still not perfect, so I think I might come up with a better solution for that yet, but this is, um, I think the, uh, the days were numbered of the bit of garden twill, so safety first and all that. This is now the evening of the fourth coat of lacquer. It's had about six hours to dry, and I'm just doing a bit of level sanding on the back of the headstock, and that's because I'm going to write the serial number on the back and I want the paint to be as level as it can be before I do that. That way when I spray more coats over and I do some level sanding, I haven't got very much level sanding to do and therefore that reduces the opportunity for me to sand through my serial number because that would be quite annoying. Um, this is all natural. So if I sand through any of this, it doesn't matter. So I'm using 320 grit, which is quite coarse, but it makes for very quick work. And if I sand in the direction of the grain, then uh, the scratches aren't particularly visible. But I'll come back with some 600 after this as well, before I write on it. The trouble with using dry sandpaper is it gets clogged up pretty quickly, so just got to remember to keep cleaning it off. This patch here is pretty much level now, but I'll get the rest of it just a little bit more level, that way I don't have as much work to do later. Here's a neat little trick, look. I've just put my tuners in here and I want my serial number to be dead centre so I'm going to stick a bit of tape that's bang in the middle like this. Now I take these tuners out and 
And then I get another piece of tape. Put it right next to it. Get rid of the first bit. And now I can write in the middle and it's perfectly straight. Uh, I saw this on Instagram, I think. Maybe Conway Instruments. Um, yeah, the amount of times I've done this and I've written it in the wrong place. This is a deco color metallic paint pen I'm using here. Lots of companies do metallic paint pens, but they're not all the same. If you use a metallic Sharpie, you'll find it probably reacts with the lacquer, or it does for me anyway. So deco color is the one to use. Six. That's the first one. Twenty twenty four. Now, I'm doing this in the evening because I want this to dry at least overnight and I probably won't spray anything until lunchtime tomorrow to let this fully dry before I paint anything over it. So this has had, oh, I think about eight coats of clear now. Um, on the whole, it's looking really good. The back and the neck, I mean, they're so, they're so smooth. You could almost take that straight to the buffer. I'd probably give it a level sound with about 1500 grip and then buff. The top on the whole is good, but I do have one issue with it. Um, and there's lots of little tiny spots where you th you'd look at it and you think it's fisheye. They're like little pinholes. And it's definitely not fisheye or solvent pop because I would see that elsewhere on the guitar. The only place I'm seeing it is in the dark spots. The dark spots are where the grain on the maple is softest. So essentially what I've done is not sealed it properly. And uh, I was looking back over the footage and I only sprayed four coats of sealer. And I'm not sure why I did that. That was, um, yeah, a mistake that I shan't make again. So I've got two choices. I could either... Um, drop fill all these little pinholes with lacquer and then spray some coats over them or I could just do some level sanding and get rid of some of it if not all of it if possible I think if I sand this with 600 I can probably get rid of most of it um, and then if need be I could do some drop filling or I could just spray some more coats and do some more sanding which that to be honest that's the per preferred option I don't um, I don't want to run the risk of sanding through but then I also I want to get it as level with as least paint on it as possible. I don't want to keep drop filling. And the other thing about drop filling is lack of shrink. So if you do a, a drop fill, then eventually that might become visible again. So you don't want to do that. So I'm going to give this a bit of a scuff sand with 600 and see if I can get some of these down. Let's see if I can show you some of these little pinholes I'm talking about. There you go. Can you see them there? But they're only in the darkest spots. So they should be fairly straightforward to sand out. So this is a 600 grit Merca pad I'm just going to use to scuff it up a bit. And again, we can see where all of these uh, little pinholes I'm talking about are. There's actually quite a lot of them. Um, they do seem to be coming out, so I'll just go at it with this for a bit. And then I think I'll spray a few more coats, do a couple more today. On the whole though, I mean apart from that small cock up, it's looking really good. Very happy with this finish. Tack cloth. Get rid of the dust. Uh, I'm not wet sanding. I've um I've gone off wet sanding a bit. No reason, I haven't really had any issues. But I don't know, I just quite like using these Merca pads actually. The benefit of sanding wet is that obviously there's no dust and your sandpaper lasts a lot longer. 
but the benefit of sanding dry is that you don't have to then dry off the surface to see where you've sanded so the trouble with it with wet sanding is everything looks the same you can't really tell where you've sanded until you've dried it off which you know I just find it just gets through so much paper towel doing that so I'll give the top a good going over with 600 and then I might go to a thousand after that that's just to get rid of those coarse 600 grit scratches and then I think I'll go over everything else with maybe a, a very fine Merkle pad like a 1500 or something just to scuff it up and that'll help the next coats adhere to what we've painted already because this has been a good few days since I last sprayed it actually I um I wanted to let the paint do a bit of shrinking before I assess these pinholes I was talking about so I think this is going to be okay there we go so I've given the whole thing a bit of a level with 600 and you can see there's still quite a lot of little spots in it but that's fine um, I could keep going and get it smoother I could probably keep going and get it completely smooth but ask yourself why take the risk of, of sanding through when you know another bit of spraying an extra day or two of spraying and sanding it's no big deal you know you think it takes what three weeks or whatever for the lacquer to cure anyway so what's another day um, I will say if you're spraying with a with a you know fairly well set up spray gun it's a lot harder to sand through the paint than you'll think it is if you're using rattle cans it's a different story the paint coming out of a rattle can is really thin and you know you don't get anywhere near the sort of coverage you get from a proper spray gun so you are more likely to have issues like that if you're using a rattle can so I'd always recommend getting yourself a compressor and a spray gun or you know one of those HVLP systems that did me very well for a little while um, but to be honest with the amount of money they cost you might as well just get yourself a small compressor and a little LVLP spray gun or a HVLP unit the um, you know they're pretty cheap to get hold of I think you can probably get yourself completely kitted out for a few hundred quid less than that if you buy a cheap gun but I'm gonna get some more lacquer on this now three coats today probably three coats tomorrow and then I reckon it'll be there'll be enough paint on there to do a final level to get rid of all these low spots and then leave it a few weeks and buff it So it's been about a month since I sprayed the last coat of lacquer. Um, this is straight off the gun and to be honest it's looking close to flawless. In fact when I first looked at it I thought crikey I'm not even going to level this I'm just going to buff it but actually I can see there's a couple of 600 grit sanding scratches from when I was doing a, a level sand and I can see some I think they're probably 1000 grit scratches there so I'm going to do a bit of 1000 and I should go over the whole thing with 2000 and then we're ready to buff it. Before I do that though I'm going to take the tape off the fretboard because I, um, I tend to do all my fret levelling and stuff and then I just buff the fretboard as well um, and then if there's any buffing compound on it it just cleans off so I find that's just a much easier way to do it. So before I pull this tape, if I just pull it, it may very well rip lacquer off so I'm going to 
take some 320 grit sandpaper and I'm just going to sand along these edges here until I break through that lacquer that's holding the tape down. I'll probably make a bit of a mess. That's all right. And then we get to pull the tape. The back of the neck, I don't think I'm even going to, well, in fact, the neck generally, I don't think I'm actually even going to bother buffing the back of the neck. That's really nice and smooth. Same as the headstock. The ebony, I shall um, give that a sand with 2000 and then buff that just because I can see some really fine scratches in it because, you know, black shows up every little swirl mark and scratch. So I just want to get that bit looking good. And in a minute, I should pull the tape off. There we go. I don't think I've ever had a better finish straight off the gun than this one. Here's the back. You know, I think for all the suffering this guitar has caused me, <laughs> I think it may be the best one. So, buffing out the finish, in my opinion, is an art form all by itself. And with that being said, I shall do another video dedicated just to buffing out the finish on this guitar afterwards, um, which hopefully I'll get that done in a few weeks. Um, if you've enjoyed this, press the like button. If uh, you like videos like this, press subscribe. Um, most of my commissions over the last year or so have actually come from YouTube watches. And uh, if you're interested in one of my builds and you don't want to uh, wait a year for it, then this yellow one here is for sale. So if you go on my website, get my email address and um, get in contact. Cheers.